The story of human evolution has long been told as a sequence of species replacing one another in a neat, linear fashion, but the genetic record has decisively overturned that view. We now know that modern humans interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans, leaving a measurable legacy in our DNA. What has become clearer in recent years is that these encounters were not unique, and that earlier hominin lineages were also mingling, mating, and leaving traces in each other's genomes. Among the most fascinating revelations is the evidence that the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans, sometimes referred to collectively as Neandersovans, interbred with an even more ancient population known as the Super Archaics. These Super Archaics had been separated from other humans for more than a million years, making the genetic exchanges between them and later humans some of the most distant admixture events known in the entire human story. A new analysis estimated that the Super Archaics diverged from the rest of the human family tree about 1.9 to 2.2 million years ago roughly the same time as the first dispersal of Homo erectus into Eurasia. That timing suggests that the super-archaics were descended from the earliest humans who established themselves across Eurasia. Their populations were surprisingly large, an effective size between 20 and 50,000, which hints at substantial geographic structure, possibly with eastern and western groups that would later interact with different populations. The key point is that when the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans expanded across Eurasia around 700,000 years ago, they did not find an empty continent. Instead, they encountered descendants of those first pioneers. Genetic signals show that they mixed with them, absorbing a small but real portion of their DNA, but exactly where this occurred is an open question. Later, Denisovans themselves interbred again with super-archaics around 220,000 years ago, suggesting that these ancient lineages persisted in Asia for hundreds of thousands of years and continued to influence the genetic makeup of later archaic populations. The admixture fraction was modest, only a few percent, but given the deep divergence time, it represents a striking biological event interbreeding between populations that have been separated for well over a million years. From a biological perspective, this is astonishing. In other animals, lineages separated for such immense spans of time are often reproductively isolated, unable to produce fertile offspring. Yet the fact that these exchanges left detectable signatures in genomes demonstrates that hominins retain the capacity to interbreed despite extraordinary divergence. It means that the boundaries between species were porous, and that reproductive compatibility extended across time depths that would normally define separate species altogether. Human evolution, then, is best imagined not as a tidy, branching tree, but as a braided river, with currents diverging and rejoining across long stretches of time. An interesting question in bringing a Neanderthal to life is skin color. Now this would probably have varied Neanderthal to Neanderthal, but DNA samples of Neanderthal specimens from modern Europe found that those individuals probably had pale skin and some possibly even red hair. And that's why we didn't have white people until then, because they hadn't been invented yet. Where did these encounters take place? The evidence allows for informed speculation. The Neanderthal expansion likely followed corridors into Western Asia around 700,000 years ago. If super-archaics were already widespread across Eurasia, the contacts may have occurred in Southwest Asia or the Indian subcontinent. Yet the later signals of admixture between Denisovans and super-archaics imply an Asian distribution as well, perhaps stretching deep into Siberia, Central Asia, or even Southeast Asia. Denisovans are known primarily from Southern Siberia and Northern China, and from genetic traces in populations from Australia and East Asia. If they absorbed DNA from super-archaics, those archaics may have lingered somewhere between Central and East Asia, possibly in regions like China or Southeast Asia, where fragmentary fossils from the Middle Pleistocene hint at unusual morphologies. One candidate group for the super-archaics is represented by the puzzling fossils from sites such as Peking Man in China or even earlier by specimens like Hexion. These fossils display a mix of archaic and derived traits and have often been difficult to assign to a clear lineage. Another possibility 
is that the superarchaics correspond to Homo erectus populations that have been established in Indonesia and China since nearly two million years ago. The fact that the genetic split dates back to the origin of the Homo genus means that erectus-like populations could very well be the carriers of this mysterious lineage. In that scenario, interbreeding between superarchaics and Neanderthals was essentially a reunion between long-separated cousins, with one branch descending from the earliest wave into Eurasia and the other from a later wave. The Cima de los Huesos hominins in Spain, dated to around 420,000 years ago, represent the opposite end of the story. They are clearly ancestral to Neanderthals, showing distinctive features in their teeth and bones. Genetic evidence confirms this ancestry, yet their genomes also contain echoes of even deeper interbreeding, signals of contact with populations that had been outside the Neanderthal Denisovan line for far longer. The study showed that the split between Neanderthals and Denisovans themselves was remarkably early, around 737,000 years ago, and that their ancestors had already been admixed with superarchaics by then. However, estimating this split is difficult due to interbreeding. This helps to explain why the Cima de los Huesos population carries a genetic history older than their bones. The Denisovans complicate the picture even further. Not only did they inherit superarchaic DNA from the Neanderthalan mixture, they also appear to have acquired additional segments directly from superarchaics later in Asia. These exchanges probably occurred in eastern Eurasia where Denisovans were widespread over 200,000 years ago. Indeed, the Denisovan genome carries signatures of multiple deep ancestries, and Papuan and Australian Aboriginal populations today retain as much as 5% Denisovan DNA, some of which itself seems to be of super-archaic origin. This makes modern Papuans among the last living carriers of these ancient ghosts, preserving fragments of DNA that trace back nearly two million years. Most Denisovan ancestry in Papuans comes from the male Denisovan lineage, hinting at the nature of those relationships. The continuation of these super-archaic signals in modern humans is a testament to the durability of genetic legacies. Even when lineages vanish physically, their DNA can persist, transmitted through generations of hybrids. The interbreeding of modern humans with Denisovans ensured that pieces of the superarchaic genome acquired long before flowed into our own species. This is genetic time travel. When a person carries a stretch of Denisovan or Neanderthal DNA that was itself borrowed from a superarchaic over half a million years earlier, they embody an unbroken chain of inheritance that loops through vanished species. The diversity of the last Neanderthals reinforces this complexity. Studies of late Neanderthal genomes show high genetic variation and evidence of multiple episodes of gene flow, both with modern humans and with Denisovans. This suggests that interbreeding was not an occasional accident, but a recurrent feature of hominin life. If Neanderthals and Denisovans were willing to mate with each other and with modern humans, it is not surprising that their own ancestors did the same with whatever archaic populations they encountered. Interbreeding was the universal solvent that blurred boundaries, maintaining connections across time and geography. Imagining the encounters themselves is necessarily speculative. Around 700,000 years ago, when the Neanderthalans migrated across Eurasia, they may have encountered small, dispersed bands of super-archaics. These people would have looked different, perhaps smaller-brained, with more primitive features reminiscent of Erectus. But cultural differences may have been modest. Both groups probably made Aculean tools, hunted game, and used fire sporadically. When groups met at water sources or while tracking herds, social exchanges could have included violence, avoidance, but also alliances and unions. Even a small number of successful pairings could have transmitted DNA that remains detectable today. Later, Denisovans roaming Asia would have repeated this pattern. In some valleys, they would have been the dominant group. In others, they would have encountered remnants of super-archaic peoples who had clung on in ecological refugia. The jungles of coastal Southeast Asia may itself have been such a meeting ground. From there, the Denisovans spread both eastward and southward, mixing with local super-archaics and later with incoming modern humans. 
The genetic mosaic we observe today is the palimpsest of these repeated encounters. Speculation about fossil representatives of the superarchaics often centers on enigmatic skulls that do not fit neatly into Neanderthal, Denisovan, or modern categories. The Dali skull from China, with its combination of a large brain case and archaic traits, is one possibility. The Hexian fossils, also from China and over 400,000 years old, seem unusually primitive for their age, suggesting deep continuity from earlier Homo erectus-like populations. In Indonesia, Homo erectus-like populations persisted on Java long after Neanderthals had spread into Eurasia. These populations could have been part of the super-archaic network that contributed genes to Denisovans. Even the mysterious Jiahe mandible from Tibet assigned to Denisovans might conceal deeper signals from earlier archaics that had lived in the region for hundreds of thousands of years. Ultimately, the lesson of interbreeding with super-archaics is that human evolution was not a story of replacement alone, but of entanglement. Populations met and mixed, carrying forward legacies of encounters that blurred lines and challenged species boundaries. The genes we carry are not simply from modern humans, or from Neanderthals and Denisovans, but from still older lineages whose bones may never be found. The recognition of these ghost populations forces us to abandon tidy categories and to embrace the reality of a braided, reticulated ancestry. It is also a reminder of our shared humanity. Even groups separated for over a million years were not so different that they could not interbreed. They were people, with urges, desires, and the capacity to reproduce. Their unions, whether fleeting or enduring, ensured that no lineage was ever completely lost. Every human alive today carries within them echoes of forgotten lovers who met in distant valleys of Eurasia long before our own species even existed. And so when we speak of interbreeding with superarchaics, we are not only describing a genetic fact, but also acknowledging a profound truth about the human story. We are all hybrids, not just of Neanderthals and Denisovans, but of lineages stretching back into the deep Pleistocene. Our species is the product of ancient entanglements, of love and lust across divides that seemed immense, yet proved bridgeable. The superarchaics are gone, their faces lost to time, but in our genomes their whispers remain, telling us that the story of humanity has always been one of mixing, mingling of boundaries crossed, and of a shared destiny written in the braids of DNA. Thank you for watching and exploring our human history together.